Hey, it's Roy Newgate, and we're back already with another new video. And for this one, I wanted to discuss three specific characters, and those characters are Law, Kid, and Zoro. And the reason why I wanted to talk about them a little is because of this ongoing debate involving these three. And usually, you know, the debate is always, oh, who is stronger between Law and Zoro, or who's stronger between uh, Kid and Zoro, and a little more, or rather, a little less commonly, who is stronger between Law and Kid. I know some people have them as just straight up equals, you know, with n neither one not doing the other. And that's probably, you know, based on the fact that they were both in the fight against Big Mom and they both have the same um, exact bounty and everything. As far as Law versus Kid goes, I think, you know, you can make arguments for either side of that. I think ultimately it will be Kid that comes out on top. And that's um, a product of him being a conqueror. And now, just being a conqueror alone, I don't think that makes you stronger than law. But realizing the potential of a conqueror, which I think entails, you know, awakening your conqueror's abilities and infusing it with your, you know, um, your fighting style. Being able to do that, just like Luffy did in chapter 1010, I think that's what Kid needs to do to make it a definitive, you know, answer between who's stronger between him and law. Because currently, if you ask anybody who's strong between the two, seven times out of ten, you'll find that people say Law. And I feel like this is um because, you know, Law's attacks are just flashier. They look cooler and everything. And Kid, most of his attacks just aren't that pleasing to the eye. So then, you know, as a result, they're downscaled a little bit and people don't think they're that strong or that powerful and everything. But I think as far as the story goes, Oda has done his best efforts to make kid look formidable or he's you know the portrayal he's trying to uh pass on is that kid is every bit as formidable as law but now let's talk a little bit about the guy in this discussion who is not a supernova captain and that's of course zoro zoro you know he didn't take part in the defeat of an emperor but i still don't think that's a reason to leave him out of the discussion in fact Currently, I think Zoro is stronger than both Kid and Law individually. I think there's many angles you can approach this from and many ways to look at it. But my biggest thing is the fact that on the rooftop, we saw all of these guys perform individually without their power ups. And who shunned the brightest? When it comes to these three, it was Zoro, of course. And it was not only that he outshunned them on the rooftop. He did this while on his last legs, more injured than we've ever seen him in battle. You know, taking a double Yonko attack and, you know, fighting through it, able to scar Kaido. And with what I believe was only Armin Minaki for, you know, various reasons. Um, I mean, you can deduce what it was for yourself, but based on what we know and based on the dialogue, it seemed pretty evident to me that when Zoro scar Kaido, it was with only Armin Minaki. And his Conqueror's Hockey leaked out as in a short burst that gave Kaido the inclination that this guy is a Conqueror's Hockey user. But then, you know, the fact that he was able to accomplish that, and then he went on to receive actual Conqueror's Hockey coding, I think that's what places him over Kid in Law. I think the portrayal that Conqueror's Hockey has in this story, it places it above any awakening or any devil fruit ability on its own. And then you even have Kaido, who is a mythical Zoan devil fruit user. You know, he has every reason to hype up Devil Fruits. And yet instead, he places Haki on his pedestal saying, only Haki can transcend all. And he uses the best example he could in the Pirate King Gold Roger because he did not have any Devil Fruit. He was just a swordsman with Haki. And his greatest and most renowned rival in Whitebeard had one of the most powerful Devil Fruits of all time. And yet Roger was still going eco with this man so it just shows how far hockey can take you now back again to the whole debate between zoro kid and law i feel like you know a lot of times there are um arguments made that leave out a lot of context and just you know feel outright disingenuous because um the biggest one i hear is the fact that people say law and kid defeated an emperor and then zoro almost lost to a commander now i don't think it's fair to say he almost lost to a commander when the, the, the part of the fight that he was losing was before he got his power up. And if we're going to use the pre-power up versions of these guys, look at Law and Kid. They were laid out, you know, damn near unconscious, if not unconscious with Big Mom before they tapped into their awakenings. So, you know, the whole thing with using pre-power up versions of a character and comparing it to the power up versions of another character, that just doesn't work. It, it's just nonsense. And I don't I don't see the merit in it at all. But beyond just the fact that Zoro um, struggled before his power up, it's also the fact that 
King is a character unlike any we've seen before. You know, he he comes from a race that has this innate durability that renders them damn near invulnerable to damage. And when you take in what makes King so special, you can see how anybody would struggle with this kind of fighter on the first um attempt or the first round, you know, or the first their first go at him. I mean, this guy was taking attacks that made Kaido bleed, you know, attacks that were effective against Kaido, but they just, he just shrugged them off. He treated them as if they were a fly on the wall. And that's absolutely insane. And, you know, um, we were all trying to figure out what was going on. Like, you know, how is he doing this? Like, why can't he be hurt? And then it began to make sense once you realize that Lunarians can be invulnerable to damage once they turn on their flame, but they sacrifice that for their speed. So knowing what we know about Zoro and knowing how powerful his attacks were before he got coding, you throw that coding multiplier on all his attacks now and, you know, the potential is just out of this world. Like, can you imagine a coded Ashura or a coded billion fold slash? Like, I can't even begin to imagine what kind of damage those attacks would do. Now, there's another side of it where, you know, it might be made a point of emphasis that Zoro has a timer and he can't use Enma continuously. But... I would compare that to the fact that Kid and Law were supposed to be on a timer as well with um, their awakenings. You know, they even said that they would only use their awakenings on their last legs as a last resort because of how dangerous it is to use them. And they ended up using them a lot longer than we expected. So I think if you took Zoro and added him to this fight and took one of them out, I think it would be the same thing. They would be able to use their power ups as long as they needed to. And the difference is, the one stark difference is the fact that Zoro was not only fighting against Enma, but then there was also the fact that he was on a timer with a mink drug. And once the fight concluded, all that pain started rushing in. But it didn't start at the end of the fight. Um, even, you know, in the concluding moments of the fight, while he was making his final attacks, you can see there is an effect on his body. And um, it's not exactly clear because... You know, there's no dialogue indicating what's going on, but you can make a guess that the drug was beginning to take its effects while he was fighting. You know, you see his biceps and everything looking like they're about to rupture um, and King hadn't even attacked him. So you can guess that this was the drug beginning to take effects or, you know, the harmful effects of taking a drug were beginning to take hold. So had Zoro been in this fight and he didn't have to work against the drug, I think he would have been in the same condition as Law and Kid. You know, he wouldn't have to deal with double damage from a combined Emperor attack on top of all the damage he took against King and, you know, all of that just piling up on him and just... um you know, doing all this damage to his body. But all those timers aside, you know, the limited time the Law and Kid could use Awakening, uh, the limited time the Zoro had with Enma, I think we could put those all to the side to some extent now. Um, I think that we can judge these characters assuming that they can fight to their full capacity for a drawn out battle. I had this thought in my mind for some weeks now, but it was kind of reinforced in the most recent chapter for me because um, we see Law using his Awakening, like, immediately he doesn't even consider using his base abilities or anything like that so the fact that he's using it and he seems pretty comfortable using it you know not like before where he's like oh this is only for a last resort and everything i feel like the time that he had after the battle and the battle itself got him more used to his awakening to the point that he can use it casually now and of course i think the same exact thing applies to kid and zoro so if we take these three again and um compare them at the level where they're at right now where i think they don't have to worry about a timer i think it goes zoro and then either law or kid in either order because you know i think you can make arguments for both and it's kind of hard for me to pick a side because they're both generally just awakened devil fruit users and although most people will go with the op op user being superior um and you know i'm not sure maybe he is superior but i can't say one way or another for myself like i i'm just not sure but let's say we're comparing them at the end of the story and i'm not sure what's going to transpire between now and then what fights all these three guys might have but i will have the conquerors at the top you know i'll have the awakened conquerors over law every time and this means if kid awakens conquerors coding i'll put him above law if Kid never awakens Conqueror's Coding, then Law, I can see him being stronger. Now, the thing is, with Law, I, I feel like Oda uh, made a sort of emphasis on Conqueror's being stronger than Law 
in Dressrosa when uh, Doflamingo pointed that Luffy being a Conqueror's user means that he may have higher potential than even Law, who is an OP OP user. And Doflamingo did extensive research on this Devil Fruit, so, you know, I'd, I'd figure that he knows what he's talking about. But then when it comes to Law versus Zoro, I think the argument is twofold, because not only does Zoro have the Conqueror's argument over him, he also has the Swordsman argument over him. And for Zoro to be the strongest Swordsman, I absolutely believe that means he has to be stronger than Law. I guess some people would try to say that Law isn't just a swordsman, he's also a Devil Fruit user, he's also the Opie Opie user. I think it all counts as the same thing. I think Law is a swordsman who uses the Opie Opie in his fighting style. So he uses the Opie Opie as a sword fighter. And you can see it in how, you know, his strongest techniques involve use of his sword. So, you know, you can imagine maybe if another user, a non swordsman had the Opie Opie, they'd add their own creativity to it and use a contrasting style that fits their preferred method of combat. So just to go through it one more time, I definitely think right now Zoro is a second strongest supernova with either Law and Kid being the third. End of series though, I see it either being Zoro or Kid second with Law being fourth. And that's all heavily dependent on if Kid awakens Conqueror's Coding because if he awakens Conqueror's Coding, then his potential is through the roof. He can absolutely be the second strongest supernova at that point. And it all depends on where Oda takes the story because I'm just not sure where he's going to lead everything for Law and Kid specifically. We know who Zoro is going to defeat. We know where he will be the strongest swordsman in the world. We know that for a fact. Law and Kid, however, we don't know what opponents he's going to have for them and how they will fare because currently we have Law fighting Blackbeard and we all know he's going to lose. So it's stuff like that that makes it harder to gauge and harder to tell where Oda's taking these guys and what level they're going to reach at the end of the story or where they will rank compared to the other top tiers in the series. Originally, my thought process was that Law and Kid were going to defeat Admirals. I'm not sure if that's still in the pipeline because I do think it's important for them to get a solo victory at some point. I don't think it would be fair for them to get lost in the annals of history as just these losers who can never accomplish anything. And I mean, sure, you know, people will call them winners because they defeated Big Mom. But the fact that they did that together, I don't think it speaks loud enough. I think they have to do something on their own that solidifies their spot at the top of this era. Who knows, honestly, it could be a new character that Oda introduces, but I feel like if he does that, then he has to give them the portrayal of being a top tier because it wouldn't hit the same if it's just somebody we've never heard of who doesn't have um, a reputation large enough for Law and Kid to eat off of. But yeah, as I've been saying, there's endless possibilities, so we'll see how that all pans out. But with that, we've reached the end of this video. Tell me what you think, though. Who do you think is the second strongest supernova? As a matter of fact, who do you think is the top five strongest supernova in order now and at the end of the story? Comment all of your thoughts down below, but also don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell for more videos like this.